warrant. Has he read this document, which he was sworn to uphold? Now, I will not have you libel Abraham Lincoln. I don't understand the problem with registering guns. We register cars. Mark Levine brings you the news the government doesn't want you to know. Today, an explosive story about connections between white supremacists and Islamic terrorists. When there's a conflict between Scalia's conservative values and the Constitution of the United States, he throws away the Constitution. When we do have secret prisons, that is not what America's all about. Let's go to Mark in five, four, three, two. Good evening, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. President Obama gave an impassioned speech this morning uh, to, saying that he would defend the, the American Jobs Act, the package that he has put before Congress, and ridiculing Speaker Boehner's approach. My name is Mark Levine, and this will be the topic today. Not just American Jobs Act and President Obama's approach, but whether he has gone out to another side and then come back. The title of tonight's show is Welcome Back to the Democratic Party, President Obama. You see, it really wasn't that long ago, a year or two ago, that the Democrats had decided, well, we really couldn't pass an extension of the middle class tax cuts, the Obama tax cuts during the stimulus package, because Republicans were insisting that multimillionaires be paid too. You may recall right before the election in 2010, the Democrats decided they would wait, wait until after the election, a terrible mistake, until, until, until later to have a vote on that bill. Well, what happened? We all know. The Republicans said that at the end of 2010, they would raise taxes on all of us. They would harm the nation's economy. They would do their best to destroy the nation's economy unless President Obama gave rich people a lot more money. And, uh, well, Obama didn't want taxes raised on everybody, so he acquiesced. He caved in. In order to protect the 98% of Americans that Republicans wanted to raise taxes in, on, he caved in and allowed the Republicans to get their way. And so he extended the Bush tax cuts and he gave an extra tax break to multimillionaires. Then, just a few months ago last summer, the Republicans again put Obama to the wall. They said, if you don't do exactly what we want in exactly the way we want, again, no tax increases on millionaires, what are we going to do? We're going to bring the nation into default. We're not going to pay the nation's debts. We are going to indeed allow the economic crisis. I mean, the, America had never defaulted in 200 years, plus years of our history. We will stop paying our debts. These are the kinds of threats that Republicans gave. And again, President Obama caved in. Again, he said, well, I don't want the economy to collapse. I don't want the United States, a world economy to collapse. I'll cave in, I'll give in, and I will agree uh, to pretty much whatever you want, Republicans, as long as you don't allow us to default. Of course, uh, for uh, two centuries, the debt ceiling had been raised. No one had ever threatened default before. This was a new tactic by the Republicans. President Obama was against the wall. In doing that, in making those decisions, he made plenty of Democrats mad at him, including myself. He lost most of his liberal base. In fact, if you look at the reason why his approval rating has declined so much, it is because he has lost so much of his liberal base by caving into the Republicans. Well, now we find Obama 2.0. Here he is in September, and as I said, welcome back to the Democratic Party, Mr. President. He has come, he has defended the issues that he said he defended all along. Basically, helping the middle class, helping small business, and if millionaires have to pay an extra tax, if Warren Buffett has to pay the same tax rate as secretary, he's okay with it. Thank you, Mr. Obama, for standing up for the American people. I just wish you'd done it sooner. And in order to debate this, I've invited Mike Lane, Republican strategist. Thank you, Mike, for coming here on the show. Mark, thank you for having uh, me. What do you think of Obama 2.0? Uh, well, it's actually back to Obama 1.0, where he was in the that's beginning true. of his presidency. That's true. Fair enough. Uh, he went to 2.0, which I didn't like. This and, is 3.0. And, and, and it's the stuff that made him unpopular. It's the stuff that has made him perhaps the worst president since Jimmy Carter or the worst president of the United States, including Jimmy Carter. Uh, I love the new uh, Barack Obama. He has just sealed his uh, re-election defeat in November of 2012. Uh, and we'll finally be able to focus on jobs and getting the economy moving again when we have him out of the way. <laughs> well, let's talk about, first of all, you said Obama 1.0. I agree with you that he's going back to what he promised in his campaign. If that's Obama 1.0, that's the part that got him elected. You might remember that was so wildly successful, Obama 1.0, that he got uh, the greatest electoral vote and greatest popular vote in uh, more than 20 years, 25 years. He did very well on that. I would argue his unpopularity came from 
2.0, as it were, came when he compromised with the Republicans, when they threatened to ruin the economy, to throw us into fault, to raise taxes on everybody. And Obama said, please, please don't do that. I'll do whatever you want. He caved in to the Republicans, and he lost a lot of support, not just among liberals and Democrats, but among the middle class. That's when his numbers started to tank. To me, going back to his promises, back to what he said he would do in the election, this is something that is his best shot to regain his popularity. Mark, he, he has lost a lot of his base, but where he really lost it was in Obama 1.0 when he became the most partisan president that we've had, perhaps in the history of the, uh, of the United States, refusing to work with the other party, refusing Whoa. to even speak or talk or meet with the other party, when he rammed the unwanted health care uh, uh, bill that was a job killer down America's throats, uh, that's when he lost the independence, the people who swing back and forth and are the ones who would decide elections, they are not going to vote for him. This is over, Mark. That's what he lost. I've got to be honest with you, Mike. I don't know whether you believe your own rhetoric or whether this nope, is something this you're is just fact. trying to sell to people. But when a president adopts the other party's agenda, when a president uh, says, uh, I will do whatever you want, just don't harm the economy, don't raise tax on the middle class, uh, I don't think that can be considered partisan. If anything, uh, President Obama has been the most Republican president we've had in a while. I look forward to him becoming a Democratic president again. I don't know how it is partisan to give in to everything the Republicans say. Uh, explain that to me. All right. Look, you're right about one thing. The National Journal, no conservative rag at all, uh, deemed this proposal of President Obama's not a serious proposal, but a proposal aimed at his base, trying to get them back on board. You're talking now, about the American Jobs Act. I'm talking about, yes, the American Jobs Which had Act. Lot, every this piece is, of it was proposed is, by Republicans is, at one stage or another. This is the effort to get the liberal base back on board. He can do that, and he can solidify himself at about uh, 45, 46 percent. But he's never going to get over that because the independents, the swing voters, the people who decide elections have had it beyond up to here with that, and they're looking forward to a president who shows leadership. They're looking forward to a president who understands the economy. They're looking forward to a president who will focus on jobs, focus on jobs, and focus on jobs rather than running up to the UN this week and spending all kinds of time not focusing on jobs. I mean, the fact Preve of the matter... Preventing the, a, the fact, the fact, the, the fact, the, the fact of the matter is... is the fact of the, the fact, fact of the matter is, Mark, He's done. He's toast. The people have tuned him out. They've stopped listening to him. He's overexposed himself. And now it's all a matter of results, which he has none to show. He's done. Mike, your party declared President Obama toast about one week into office. You may recall, Rush Limbaugh says, I hope he fails. And if America fails, that's right. fine. That Mitch good. McConnell said, I want to make sure that he has to be a one-term president. That's mm -hmm. our primary goal, not jobs. Not helping the economy, not helping the American people. Our goal, our sole goal as Republicans is getting rid of Barack Obama. When health care came, you may recall he invited Republicans again and again and again. He put in their proposal, mandates, as you may recall, was a Republican proposal, sponsored by Mitt Romney, by the way, in Massachusetts. These are Republican ideas. And the American Jobs Act is full of Republican ideas. Lowering taxes, for example, payroll taxes. The only taxes the Republicans seem to want to raise are those that affect the middle class. Helping small business. When did Republicans become for raising taxes and against small business. Explain that to me. Mark, first of all, there's absolutely nothing unconstitutional about a mandate at the state level. The unconstitutionality of mandating purchase of a product in, in the stream of commerce comes at the federal level where the federal government is, you know, it, it's not one of the enumerated powers. It is the most egregious abuse of the Commerce Clause that I've ever seen and that most people have ever seen and judges are ruling that way, in fact. Actually, the so, great majority, uh, of courts have no. ruled that it's perfectly constitutional. There, no. are, there is one no. outlier at one court of appeals level. Oh, contraire. Oh, contraire. Virginia's it's, case uh, just got dismissed last week. Uh, that was a that was a standing issue. That was not the merits of the issue. Well, that's right. And about um, so. 14 cases have been dismissed for standing. And on the merits, I believe it's about four to two, holding uh, that it is constitutional. Yeah, the Supreme Court will decide. The, the Supreme uh, the, Court will decide. But I don't think that health care that the real fight was about constitutionality. I it think was. Republicans made it clear they didn't like to change the current system. Under the current mm -hmm. system, pharmaceutical companies made massive profits, and they raked over the American middle class by the coals. They could get billions of dollars. Healthcare is one sixth of the nation's economy, and if they can grab more from the middle class, they can become even richer, and then they can give money to Republicans. If Republicans had a different health care plan, how come in three years they've never proposed it? Mark, as you know, the administration let all the health care lobbyists into the White House in their secret late night, you know, dark room meetings and stuff like that, and they gave the pharmaceutical lobbyists 
everything they wanted in that bill. That's why the mm. pharmaceutical folks supported this bill because they knew they were going to make the same kind of money that they've been making. You know, Obama, you know, letting all these lobbyists in, keeping all the White House logs as to who came in, who didn't come in secret, not not even letting them be subject to FOIA and stuff like that. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. You know, it's like you don't remember the, the 2006 yeah. Medicare bill where George Bush uh, gave massive pharmaceutical subsidies. And when uh, in, in this bill, Obama cuts those massive subsidies to pharmaceutical companies, the Republicans complain. Look, uh, you know, the fact is the American people didn't want this. The American people. Sure they did. The American people wanted to keep the health care that they had. The president promised them that they would be able to keep the health care that, that they had. They will at it's, a cheaper it's, cost. It's amazing. No, the president's own uh, health care actuary is, is testifying to the fact that uh, the people will not be able to keep their they own health care. They will be able to keep their health care. No, no, they will not. Uh, because they're, it's it, getting more expensive as a result of Obamacare. No, it's, it's getting, getting more expensive as a result of Obamacare. You can't see your own doctor anymore. It's, it's a disaster. The American people know it's a disaster, and that's when he first started losing his popularity. Why do Republicans support the current system and are opposed to any health care reform? Do they believe that, that health care should be, instead of one-sixth of the nation's economy, half the nation's economy, all the nation's economy? When will Republicans no. come up with a plan of their own for health care? They had a plan. It's called competition. The Democrats... Wh where, what's the name of that the plan? The Democrats rejected... Wh who introduced it? They rejected competition in the marketplace. Who introduced that plan? And, and when you reject competition and you, instead you have government regulation, you have inefficiencies, you have increasing cost, you have less delivery of quality health care service, and that's why the American people didn't want it. That's why they don't want it now, because they see the downward spiral of health care. Obama took his eye off the jobs ball, well, we'll and he focused on everything else. We'll talk about jobs. But, but, two and a half but, years into the administration, want, where are the jobs? Well, two and a half years in this administration, eight years in the Bush administration, uh, six years Republican Congress in the Clinton administration, uh, the Republicans for two decades refuse to modify the current health care system. And I want to know either why they love the current system so much or why they refuse to change it. The, the, the Republicans want competition. Competition is Who's what... Bill? It creates excellence and Paul that's Ryan's what bill? creates... It creates excellence and that's what creates uh, competition price is competition. Competition is one word. Okay. Competition Has there is ever a been word. a Republican bill to reform health care? Yeah, the Republicans did try and have health plans that could market across state lines and the Democrats rejected it. So that's the solution so instead of, to instead all of, of the health care problems. Of it's, it's Allow everyone to give the worst care possible like they do no. in Mississippi or South Dakota. Look, when you have a Race to the bottom, that's the when, solution. When you have a state like Maine where there's only two health care plans and you can bring in ten more, I'm all, price goes I'm all down, for quality goes up. But what I'm not Democrats for, are against competition. What I'm not for is allowing people to get into health care plans that don't cover them when they're sick. That's what the Republicans want. Democrats don't want that. Hey, if you want to join the debate, 888-488-MARK. You can... Argue with both of us. We'll be right back. Listen to smoke before you give it a try. Only you. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Fire. Cause there's nothing very funny about drink that fight. Nothing very nice. A homeless man. So if we're going to discourse, it's what you desire. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Only you can prevent wildfires. Fire! Why don't you just wash your car at home? I wash my car. Everything runs down the street and down into the storm drains. With all the chemicals and the soaps and waxes, the last thing I want to do is poison my own drinking water. At least here, it's all contained and recycled on site. That's why I also take my car in for oil changes instead of doing it myself. I might take a chance on spilling stuff. You know what the best part is? What? More time to kick back and watch the game. How far would you go to protect the planet? I want you to build an ark. Here we go. Okay, that's good. Oh, okay. Ow. Oh, oh, oh. Maybe there's another way. People, the flood is imminent. Is it too much to ask for a little precipitation? Go to fightglobalwarming.com to find out what you and your community can do to reduce global warming pollution. Somewhere around the world, there are men and women of the armed forces risking their lives, helping rebuild communities after natural disasters, collecting toys for needy children, tutoring kids in school. These are your sons and daughters who work to keep us safe, secure, and free. 
dedicated men and women who put their country first. Here again, the inside scoop with Mark Levine. Inside scoop debating the politics of the day. You too can join in this discussion. You can tell me you disagree with me, you, uh, Mark Levine. You can tell Mike Lane, Republican strategist, you disagree with him. You can tell us you disagree with both of us. All you have to do is pick up the phone and dial in toll free 888 488 Mark, 888 488 6275. Okay, so the health care debate, uh, we disagree, but I agree with you on this. The main focus should be jobs. It should have been jobs from the beginning. Now, one of the things in President Obama's Jobs Act is to keep payroll taxes low. Republicans want to raise those payroll taxes. They want to raise taxes on 95% of our working Americans. One of the things that President Obama mentioned in his speech, which I thought was very interesting, is Republicans have taken a pledge, the Grover Norquist pledge, not to raise taxes. But it appears the Grover Norquist pledge only applies to taxes on millionaires. They're perfectly happy to raise taxes on the other 95, 98% of the American people. Why do Republicans support an increase in the payroll tax right now when the economy is weak? All right, Mark, first of all, let's define our terms. Are you agreeing? Uh, with the concept that if you let a tax break expire and it reverts back to its permanent rate, that that is a tax increase? You know, it's all, you can, it's all I, semantics. I just want to know if you're agreeing it, it, to that. It's all semantics. Um, sh sure, if you want to call it a tax increase, that's fine. No, I want to know what you want to call it. Are you, are you calling it a tax increase? You know, uh, it, it is, you're, that, we both know what it is. It's reverting back right. to where it was. Reverting back to the regular right. level. Republicans have insisted in the past that when it came to the, Ob the Bush tax cuts expiring and reverting back to the prior level. They called that a tax increase. They said that 100,000 times. Why won't they consider the payroll tax a tax increase? Well, it, 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 reverting it, back. it, it may be that they should. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not you know, married to that reservation. Uh, the evidence is that it doesn't work, but I don't think it creates that much harm either. Uh, it when, doesn't work in creating jobs? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, when, when, when you're making a decision to create a job, and the job is maybe going to pay fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year, uh, and you're going to have uh, benefits on top of that, taking it up to let's say seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars a year, uh, and you have a five thousand uh, dollar maybe uh, uh, tax break in in terms of uh, creating that job. You're not going to create a permanent position based on getting a $5,000 break on that particular thing. You have to have confidence in the economy, and that kind of incentive, uh, although it's only payable when you, when you, uh, uh, when you, when you get the, um, uh, the job created, it, it's not a long-term incentive. So Because the decrease in the payroll tax cut is considered temporary. Right, because because it's considered because people temporary. know it's going to go back eventually in two, three, well, four no, no, years. no, it's it's not just temporary. It's you have to have you have to have confidence that that seventy five thousand or eighty thousand seventy five or eighty thousand dollars that you're spending on creating that job and compensating that individual. It's going to come back you, to you. You as have business. to have confidence that that it's going to be business. Right. So so the disincentive yeah. to now. creating jobs. Uh, although the payroll tax is certainly a drag uh, on creating job, the disincentive now is the bad economy. It's not the it's not the drag on the payroll taxes. But I would I would not fall on my sword over that single one issue. If that's the compromise that we need to make to get a deal through, uh, I would go with that. I'm glad to hear that. But let, let me focus a little bit more on this uh, confidence in the economy because I agree with you. I think that it's confidence in the economy is the reason why businesses aren't hiring. In fact, businesses, big businesses particularly have more cash on hand than they've had in more than half a century. Mm -hmm. You have to go back more than 50 years to find the massive amounts of cash, dollar bills, just sitting in the vault, waiting to be spent. And sitting and, overseas. And they won't spend it. Some and overseas, overseas. A lot of it here at home. They're not spending the money. They have couple, massive, couple trillion overseas. massive amounts of cash. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're not spending it. And they're not spending it because there's not enough demand for their products. You agree? I mean, you're not going to hire a new worker to make more widgets if there's not enough demand for your widgets, right? I mean, if a lot of people want your widgets, yeah, you'll hire someone in because, hey, people really like those products. Uh, you know, you need someone else to make them. But if no one's buying, you don't need to hire anyone. It's not just current demand. It's perceived future demand as well. And the real perception on future demand is that it's not going to be there in the near term. Okay. And what causes demand for people's products? 
People believing in the economy, people having money in their pockets. Pe pe people, well, right? uh, disposable income, right. and people believing in the economy, yes. Right. Now, who buys most products in this country? Is it the 2% that are millionaires, or is it the 98% of us uh, that go, I mean, I mean, when you look at, I, I said widgets, when you look at, I don't know, oh, most cars, fine. or most um, uh, frosted flakes, or mo I mean, any product out there, most, most ties, uh, except for the really expensive silk ones, who buys most of them? It's not millionaires. Most are bought by middle class people. You agree with me there? Uh, yeah, the uh, volume consumption is uh, the middle Absolutely. class. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so payroll tax, that's a tax that affects primarily the middle class because after all, uh, for the middle class, that's 2% that's of their wages. For anyone that earns under $100,000, if you earn a million dollars, that's 0.2% of your wages. If you're on salary, you're, you're hardly going to notice it. If you're a billionaire, it's 0.002%. It's, it's a drop in the pan. So this is something that affects the middle class. Now, Mitch McConnell said just the other day that if we raise taxes on millionaires, Raising taxes meaning going reverting back to the Clinton tax rates, again, whatever you want to call it, it basically increases their taxes by two, three percent. On these people that have massive amounts of cash, that suddenly they're not going to create a job. These same people that would have created a job, now if we raise their individual income tax rates two percent, they're not going to create a job. Uh, given that we both have decided that it's demand of the economy that's causing people not to hire. That's well, a pretty uh, foolish no. statement by Mitch McConnell. No, no, it, it? it's demand and it's investment. I mean, they, they work together. Uh, you know, you, you don't have solely a demand-driven economy. You can have an investment-driven uh, You need economy, enough cash to but, invest. But you need, well, you, you, need, you need confidence that the investment you're going to make is going to pay off. Sure, you need, you need demand for your products, you need confidence your investment's going to pay off, and you need enough mm -hmm. cash to make your investment. Well, they already have massive amounts of cash. We've already determined that. And demand is low. Demand is low because the middle class is hurting right now. But giving more money to people who have tons of money, who are not going to invest because they're afraid the middle class aren't going to spend, that's not going to help the economy. Mitch McConnell's wrong there, isn't he? Well, no. I mean, giving more money to people who aren't going to spend it. First of all, those are the people who will invest it, okay? So, well, but said, they won't we, invest we just it. That's just my point. No, but well, here's well, of my course point. They, will. they have they massive will, amounts of cash they, they're not investing now. They will invest it when they have confidence that the money they've invested will provide them with the rate of return that they want on that investment. I agree with you. I agree with you. And they don't have confidence now. Right. But that lack of confidence has nothing to do with individual income tax. No, rates. no. They, they, it has to do with no, no, the, the bad economy. The, the, well, it has to do with their perception that if they they don't know what their costs are going to be if they invest it. They don't know what health care is going to cost them, although they know it's going to cost them more than they think. Uh, they don't know. Uh, Actually, your, according to the Congressional Budget Office, it will decrease their costs. Well, uh, you know, the CBO has been wrong before. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, we'll, we'll, In 2014. No, we, we, we won't see because it will be repealed. No. Uh, anyway, uh, they're, they're the ones who will invest. They're the ones who will provide and create the jobs uh, when, the, when the investment atmosphere gets it. When, when, when they know that their taxes are not going to be increased, they will invest it. But right wait, wait, now, wait, wait, they're wait, wait, scared I, 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 that their I, I, taxes are going to So why would they, wait, why would they invest if they fear their taxes are going up? I want to press you on that. Because I really think there's a fallacy here, and you're a smart guy, Mike. You're a nice guy. Uh, it's, you can it's admit Echo 101. You, you, you can admit when your party's wrong here. And when As Mitch McConnell, McConnell said, says, "If this is the deal I have to cut to get a, to get a bill, then I'll do it." Well, but, and we'll, we'll talk about the other portions of the Jobs Act. We'll get to that. We got a whole hour, but I want to focus really on this principle that Mitch McConnell and you see some people on Fox News saying, "The rich are the job creators," and if we bring their taxes back to the Clinton levels, two or three percent. Uh, they're going to stop creating jobs, even though they've got this massive amount of cash, more than they've had half a century. That's silly, isn't it? Well, no, you're talking about two different things there. You're talking about the corporate cash on the sidelines, which is not the rich people. And then you're talking about the small business people. No, not small whose, business. I'm talking about big business right, right. now because well, that's, Obama that's wants to help small but, business. But, that, but that's not rich people. Uh, well, I, you know, I that's, agree that's, with that's, you. That's corporate cash. That's not rich people. And the corporations are making investment decisions. Uh, based on what they think is, is, is going to be the future. And right now they have no confidence in the future of this economy, given Obama's tax and spend and, and tax and spend and deficit spend some more uh, policies. They, they just don't believe in them and they have no confidence in them. Well, they had no confidence back when George Bush was president in 2008 either. 
I would say their confidence is based on the economy. And you seem to agree with me at the beginning of this broadcast that no, they're backing no, away no, from I'm, it a little I'm, bit. No, I, I agree. If the economy was good, they're going to invest. Right. But the economy is not going to get good if we have tax increases. That's just not going to happen. Uh, and the economy is not going to be good if we continue to spend money like it grows on trees or flows under bridges. If we have tax increases on the 98% of Americans that provide the volume of consumption, the people who buy the widgets and the ties and the frosted flakes and the cars, I agree with you. I agree with you. This economy won't improve. That's why I support leaving the payroll tax low. But tax increases on Warren Buffett, I don't think that changed the economy. One of the things that, that uh, Barack you, Obama proposed today, in addition to raising taxes back to the Clinton era, is a special tax on millionaires and specifically a tax on hedge fund managers to say they have to pay the same rates as everybody else. We've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. Warren Buffett has complained that he pays a lower rate of tax than his gender than his secretary because he gets all his massive hundreds of millions in capital gains tax. Can we get rid of the hedge fund loophole? You and I can agree on that, right? Uh, we've already agreed on that. Okay, you know, oh, I, 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 I think that that's, um, that, that's ludicrous. Uh, it's clearly, you know, earned income. It's not, uh, you know, uh, so... This isn't somebody yeah. whose house has gone up in price. This, yeah. is, this yeah. is his job. We, we, we need tax reform. Without a doubt, we need tax reform. But when we, when we stick it to the hedge fund managers, we have to find an equal and offsetting tax decrease that will keep that same amount of money in the economy. Well, here's what I don't understand, Mike. Uh, I remember arguing with you, and we've been around a while, uh, in 06, 07, 08. And I supported something the Democrats then called pay as you go. And this is back before mm -hmm. the great Bush Depression. This was 05, 06, 07. The economy wasn't, wasn't going great, but as good as it did in the 90s, but it was, it was doing pretty well. I mean, it was, it was doing okay. And at the time, I said, you know, we, we've got a decent economy right now. If you want to, I don't know, invade Iraq, or you want to give a big subsidy to pharmaceutical companies or oil companies, you should offset it via either a tax increase or cutting spending somewhere else. And you said, ah, pay as you go. It, it, it's overrated. Now that we're in a depression, now that thing, times are really bad, now that taking money out of the economy really hurts the economy, now you seem to like pay as you go. Why just well, no, it's it, you know, we're in a different economy. You don't, it's worse. You don't want to take money out of the economy I when, agree. It's, when it's soft like Now's this. the time I mean, to borrow and the time... So, the so, time let's, so let's, you know, don't tax and take the money out of the economy. If you're going to increase one tax, you have to have an equal and offsetting tax uh, decrease on the other side of the ledger so that you're not taking that money out of the economy. So here we go. Uh, I, we'll keep payroll taxes low. That's the tax you decrease. And in return, we'll tax the hedge fund managers and corporate jet owners and... Sounds a lot like the American Jobs Act. There's some investment infrastructure. We'll get to that. But about half of the American Jobs Act is taxes. And that's pretty much what Obama proposes. Sounds like you're on board. Uh, well, no, no, no. He's, he's actually not proposing any. Look, look, we have, a, we have a spending problem, not a revenue problem in this country. Revenue we, is we as need, low as it's been in 50 need, years. We it's need, a percentage of the economy. We need to cut spending. That's, that's where it needs to come from. And we need to have a very serious, comprehensive, dramatic approach to cutting the spending. Do we have to cut it and now. And it has to include entitlements. Why do we have that's to cut where it it's got, now? That's where the problem is. You've just said we shouldn't raise taxes when people are hurting. Isn't this the wrong time to cut government spending when people are hurting? Shouldn't we cut it in 2014, 2015 when the economy's improved? Isn't that the time to cut spending? You know, that, that's what Barack Obama says. I agree with him. You know what, Mark? Uh, every Republican proposal to reform Social Security starts 10 years out. We're not talking about 2014, that's 2015. Social Security isn't a problem We're right talking now. about 2022 is what the Republican ideas will, are. Won't have a short so for at least so, 20 years. So, so let's... But, you Can't we what? focus on do, the economic wanna, problem right now? So let's start cutting the spending. We're willing to go 10 years out to make it happen, but let's make a commitment. we got to take a break. The phone number is 888-488-MARK. Does it really make sense to focus on Social Security 20 years from now when we've got an economic problem today? What do you think? We'll be right back. Saving for retirement might be easy for some folks, but for others, it might take a little more work. And for those who haven't started, there are still things you can do to catch up. Oh, that is good news. Like getting out from underneath past debt. And don't get wrapped up with high-interest credit cards. Let's get you some eyes. Be diversified with your investments. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Your financial goals are not out of reach. The choice is clear. For a happy ending, choose to save. Everyone with alcohol and drug addiction is in the same boat. With treatment, you can find solid ground. 
For drug and alcohol information and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Dude, are you sure you want this tattoo? Because just do it. Some mistakes in life are permanent. Like hearing loss. To learn how to protect your hearing, visit ASHA.org. You've probably heard about heart disease, but did you know that it's the number one killer of women nationwide? Heart disease claims more lives each year than breast cancer, lung cancer, or strokes combined. But there are steps you can take to protect yourself against it. For more information on how you can prevent heart disease, contact your local American Heart Association or visit their website at www.americanheart.org. I need a job. Necesito trabajo. I would like to speak English with Mark Levine. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. My guest is Republican strategist Mike Lane. Uh, Mike, here are the Democrats' problems with the Republicans. We want to focus on jobs. We want to focus on the economy. The Republicans want to focus on everything else. They want to take aim at Social Security, which is solvent for the next 20 years. They didn't do anything while Bush was president to take it on. But now that Democrats are president, they want to destroy Social Security. In fact, Rick Perry, the leading candidate for Republican uh, nominee, believes Social Security is unconstitutional. He called it a monstrosity. He called it a Ponzi scheme. Um, you know, Republicans have been fighting Social Security ever since Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I get it. Y'all hate Social Security, but it seems to me that right now we're in a crisis, and if you want to attack Social Security, that's for another day. Mark, we're not talking about attacking Social Security, and uh, is it Rick Perry? We're talking. Well, uh, look, he Rick, called it a monstrosity. Rick, Rick Perry is the flavor of the month. Okay, uh, he's not going we, to. We, we had a different flavor of the month last month, and we had a different flavor of the month the month before. Right. You know, the, the I, I stupidly predicted Tim Pawlenty. I will, I will, I will, I will and, back off. And although, that, that silly, and although I thought he was not, the most reasonable guy in the race, and which is why I'm, he's out of the race. And although I'm not making any predictions, <laughs> still I've been talking Romney, Romney, Romney yes, from the beginning. Yes, and, you have. Yes, you have. And I still think it's probably going to be Governor Romney. And he's the one that says Social Security isn't going anywhere. Yes, he, that's so, true. Okay. He has said that. Although he, he's um, made some other things less extreme than than Rick Perry. But don't you think it's interesting that the flavor of the month, as you call it, is someone who is, seems to be fervently opposed to Social Security? I mean, he called it a monstrosity, a Ponzi scheme. Uh, you know, let's see who the flavor what, what of the month... What does that say about your party? R R Ralph Nader just announced that he was going to launch a series of primary challenges against President Obama. Let's He's, see who the flavor of the month is on, on Ralph your Nader side. Ralph Nader has never you know, won a Democratic and, 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 primary or led a Democratic poll ever. Right, but... Uh, and, Rick and, Perry is getting 30% of your voters. And, and he knows that. He's not doing it this time. He's organizing different people in different states that will only campaign in those states. And he's going to have them be the... Uh, uh, the liberal uh, opposition to uh, Barack Obama. If I did know I, better, I, I would think that you folks were paying him. As well, I know you, Republicans paid you know, Ralph Nader four years I, ago. I, I, I think you know uh, Ralph's ready for the retirement home. Oh, I strong. Uh, that's the one we. we <laughs> that's the one thing we both strongly agree on. But but here, let me let me get back to my focus. Not so much on Social Security, but it does seem like every time the, Repu the Democrats want to focus on jobs. Republicans want to focus on something else. They Look, want to focus on Mark. tax cuts for the rich. They Mark. want to focus on cutting Medicare. They want to focus on spending. Why won't they support, for example, the basic infrastructure, building bridges and all that's in the American jobs? Act? Mark, from January of 2009 until January of 11, the Democrats owned the White House. They owned 60% of the Senate, and they owned 60% of the House of Representatives. They only got 60% for a very, very short time. never looked at jobs. You spent two years trying to do everything but jobs. Now the Republicans take over the House. The Republicans are focusing on economic policies that will grow the economy like and what? create jobs. Paul Ryan's and the, plan? And the Democrats won't even bring it to a vote in the Senate. The president doesn't even have a chance to veto it when he threatens to because Harry Reid won't even put it to a vote. You know, I mean... Right, and you the know, Republicans wouldn't even put to a vote when, the, the health care proposals, when, when which is why we sat there for when, a year when, and a half. When, when Obama you know, takes his eye off the jobs ball and puts his eye on everything else... Uh, but see, now, now the Republicans are saying we won't, for example, back just a few months ago, we'll, we'll consider allowing the United States to default on its debt 
if you don't do things our way. Now, that's not focused on jobs. That's c manufacturing crisis, creating a crisis that, by the way, got Syrian poorest to degrade uh, for the first time, U.S. bonds, uh, from the top rating to the second rating. Uh, by the way, caused, I think, the recent collapse in the stock market uh, in just the last couple months because everybody got nervous because Republicans were threatening to blow up the nation's economy. Y it seems to me your party's creating crises and then deflating them. I realize Obama's approval rating is low, but Republicans' approval rating is 20 points low because people are mad at Obama for not standing up to your party, but they're even madder at your party for making him do it. Look, I would, I would call it superior negotiating skills. John Boehner is quite possibly the best speaker of the House we've had in this century. Literally, he's awesome. And, <laughs> and if, the president, if the president had only agreed in the beginning to what he agreed to at the end, instead of dragging it out and all that stuff, we'd be going along humming smoothly. We wouldn't have had any of the problems that you just identified. Is it, it was fair, the president's fault. Is it fair to tie the increase in the debt ceiling to an insistence on doing things your way or the highway, the way that the Republicans did in the debt ceiling? Yes, is it that is. Fair? Absolutely. Okay. Was it wrong of the Democrats? to allow George Bush to raise the debt ceiling six, seven, eight times uh, without any crisis, without going to the wall, without... Because i got to tell you something. If Mitt Romney becomes president, the Democrats, all they have to do is filibuster, and all they're going to say, Mitt Romney, do it our way, or we're going to let the nations default, and that way a determined minority can view that Leninist strategy can always get their way. The Republicans have taught the Democrats a lesson. If you are just obstinate, and if you just threaten to blow up the nation's economy, you will get your way. Well, that's the lesson, right? I, I don't think that was the threat, no, and I don't think that's the lesson. But I will say this. Your first question was, were the Democrats stupid for not doing that during the Bush years? No, they weren't stupid, but they were foolish. They uh, should have done you it. Know, they, they, they should have they negotiated they, it, harder. It's, it's a perfectly legitimate tactic to use. Uh, they had it at their disposal. Uh, it never occurred to them, oh, gee, here's something we can use to get more things our way. Foolish. You know what? But you say it never stupid. occurred to them. I, I think Democrats knew, have always known, that they could be more partisan, that they could bring the country on edge, that they could destroy the nation's economy. And Democrats, maybe you call it foolish, I think Democrats have this weird notion of putting their country ahead of their party's prospects, and it's harmed us. I agree, it has harmed us. The Republicans understand, their party comes first. If America has to go in the toilet, they're fine with that as long as their party goes first. They want Barack Obama to fail. If America has to fail with it, that's fine. And I got to say, that kind of party discipline, it helps your party. It harms the country, but it really helps your party, and I give your party credit for it. Well, I, you're giving us credit where credit's not due, actually. I was going to give the same amount of credit to us. Look, Mark, it's all rhetoric. Uh, I, I firmly believe, from my point of view, the exact opposite of what you just articulated, and I won't even... I won't even ask you if you believe it because I think you believe most of it. And I, believe, I do believe it. I believe most of it from the other side. I think if the Democrats would put the country before their party, before their other pet project, before their demands. ideology, then, then we'd be a lot better off. Barack Obama but, but caved in twice, But that's though. what elections are all about. But, but Mike, uh, you say put their, their country first. So Barack Obama caved into the Republicans on the Bush tax cuts. Uh, Barack Obama he didn't caved cave into them. He saw the light. He saw the light? He saw the light. Uh, even Barack Obama wouldn't say that he agreed with those. He said he did it because Republicans said if they didn't do it, they were going to raise taxes on everybody else. Are you saying the president didn't believe that when he said it? He, that, that, that even though he said, I support what I campaigned for for several years, and I support it all the way up through the negotiations, and I, the Republicans said, if you don't do it, we're going to raise taxes on everyone. He said, all right, I don't want you to raise taxes on everyone. You got a knife to my throat. I'll do it, but I hate it, and it's wrong, and I'm opposed to ending it, that actually he saw the light. Come Mark, on, Mike. Mark, Mark, we live in a republic. We have an elected legislature that works independently of each other, the House and the Senate, they all work with the president. Those three bodies all work together, and somehow we stumble into a compromise that gets something okay. enacted into but, law. But the point That's is, is the that way it's always been for two years. Why is it years. that Obama and the Democrats always have to compromise and accept the Republican positions? Give me an example in the last three years where the Republicans compromised. Um, I don't know that... Uh, three years? That's a long time. Give, give me one. You know, I, I, I think that uh, the deficit reduction was a, uh, a, what deficit a huge reduction? compromise. Exactly. Exactly what Republicans... What deficit reduction? Now you're talking like a Tea Party. Or what I, deficit I, I, reduction? Why did they compromise the very, on? The very... Well, the Republic The one where they, they the said, we won't destroy the nation's no, economy if we give to our, what we want? The, re the Republicans campaigned on taking $1 trillion out of spending, rolling it back to 2008 levels before they appropriated another dime, 
and instead they settled for two reductions, one of four billion and one of 38 billion. And the numbers, as they look at it, people will tell you, well, that really wasn't 42 billion. That was really closer to six billion. So that's where the Republicans compromised. They haven't insisted on the trillion dollars in rolled back spending that they campaigned on uh, and rolling spending back to the 08 levels. When did one party uh, controlling one house? get to dictate the agenda. Because I can recall lots of times under Reagan, under Bush, when the Democrats either had the House or the Senate or both, and they didn't dictate the agenda. But the Republicans have control of one House. Uh, they, In fact, even back in 2009 and 2010, when the Democrats, as you point out, had the House and the presidency and most of the Senate, the Republicans still dictated the agenda because they filibustered more times than every other Congress in American history and said, if you don't do it our way, we'll just let the country fall apart. Why is it that right. when Republicans are in the minority, they get a say, and when the majority, they get a say, and when Democrats try to have a say as well and compromise, we're considered partisan. Do you really believe that? Yeah, I, I, you, you, the Democratic Party is the most partisan in the world. I mean, there's really? just, yeah. I mean, you make the communists over in the old Soviet Union look uh, partisan, you know, look in disarray. Well, let's just talk know. about the partisan leanings of the Democrat Party. We want to defend Social Security. Now, the vast majority of American people like Social Security. So let's you lost let's that let's in let's, of so let's let's defend Brandon. let's defend reform and improve Social Security and preserve it for future Social generations. Social Security is fine. No, it's the not. Economy is not. Social fine. Security is going broke. Social Security is fine for 20 years. I want you to name any other okay. aspect of the budget so, that's fine for 20 years. So like the president said, when Malia has to do her homework, she doesn't wait until the night before. She gets it done in advance. The Republicans reform it are now. threatening within hours to make us not pay in our national debt, which would spiral the entire world into a massive depression, bigger than the Great Depression, unless we reform something that might have trouble 20 years from now? Was the president, are you kidding was, was the president wrong? Should Malia not do her homework in advance? Should she wait until the night before if to do Malia's her homework? Malia's house is on fire. She should put the fire out before she worries about her homework due 20 years from now. Okay. I think that makes sense. So let's so let's reform spending and entitlements are part of it. Oh, well, let's let's let's, let's take let's, spending. Let's, talk about let's spending. take spending down about uh, three. Let's talk about dollars. let's let's talk about spending. Okay, you don't want to spend on infrastructure, uh, build the nation's bridges, the highways. Mark, Interest rates are at an all time low. No, Mark, Labor's at an all time low. Mark, I do, but now we can't. I do, but we can't afford it. Could we we afford don't it in the have 30s? any money. Could we afford it uh, in the Great Depression? Would you, would you say the New Deal was a mistake? We should have kept with the Hoover strategy of trying to balance the budget? I think, I think ultimately the, the New Deal didn't work. Uh, what, ha what, what got us out of that uh, depression was World War II. It Which was, not, was, it was not the New Deal. Which was massive spending, was it not? Which uh, we spent more well, than our was, GDP. Uh, it, it, we had 140% okay. of our GDP are, are, in World War II. Are you proposing a uh, fourfold increase in our military? If, if that's what you want to do to get us out, I think it'll work. It'll I'm give people jobs. I'm it'll, it'll proposing create, you know, an increase in spending. A fourfold now, increase in I military myself spending? I myself would rather spend money building bridges than killing people. But, you know, I understand that both, both do stimulate the economy. I just think it's more productive to build bridges than kill people. Well, it didn't work in the 30s, but World War II did work in the 40s. So we, we, have, we have the historical evidence. It works because World War II is a lot more massive spending than the New Deal. I mean, all you have to do is look at the economy. The spending as a percentage of GDP. The highest it's been in American history was during World War II. The New Deal, if anything, was too small, just like Obama's stimulus package was too small. If he'd done two, three trillion, we'd be swim doing now, swimmingly right now. Now I can't believe you're believing what you're saying, but I do, uh, of course. Well, you know, it, it didn't work, Mark. I mean, it's the the, the it records clear. It, it didn't work in the 30s. It didn't work in the in the uh, tens, he's, whatever he's it is. It's how it worked. It, it's it's time it's time to use the tried, true, proven method. Ronald Reagan cutting taxes on who? Reducing regulation on whom? Giving incentives to business to invest. That was what the American, got us out of the Jimmy the American, Carter recession. The American Jobs Act gives a lot of incentives to small businesses. Barack Obama wants to cut taxes on the middle class. I need to remind you, the stimulus package was 30% Mark, cutting taxes on the middle class. You only want to cut taxes on the super rich. Mark, Mark, this whole middle class thing. Obama, we need to raise taxes on millionaires and billionaires and jet owners. And then he says, oh, anybody who makes $200,000 nope. a year is a millionaire. There's a special millionaire you know tax. I don't, I, I don't want this 200000 That's middle class. 888-488-MARK. 888-488-6275 is your last chance to join in the debate. We'll be right back.
I need a job. Necesito trabajo. I would like to speak English better. Me gustaría hablar inglés mejor. I want to be a U.S. citizen. Quisiera ser ciudadano de los Estados Unidos. For over 35 years. Por más de 35 años. The Hispanic Committee of Virginia has been serving our community. El Comité Hispano de Virginia ha estado sirviendo a nuestra comunidad. Job training and placement. Capacitación, ayuda para conseguir trabajo. Education for children and adults. Educación para niños y adultos. Immigration, naturalization and medical referrals. Ayuda para los procesos de inmigración y naturalización y orientación sobre médicos are a small part of what we do. son solo una pequeña parte de lo que hacemos. For help, information, or to volunteer, para ayuda, información o para ofrecerse como voluntario contact the Hispanic Committee of Virginia. comuníquese con el Comité Hispano de Virginia Helping everyone participate more fully in American society. ayudando a todos a participar plenamente en la sociedad norteamericana. Did you notice if you were missing half your kidney function? According to the National Kidney Foundation, 20 million people have chronic kidney disease and 20 million more may be at risk and not even know it. Anyone with high blood pressure, diabetes, or family history of chronic kidney disease is at risk. Early diagnosis is vitally important. To get the whole story, talk to your doctor and visit the National Kidney Foundation at kidney.org or call for a free brochure. Because when it comes to chronic kidney disease, here again, The Inside Scoop with Mark Levine. Welcome back to The Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. My guest is Republican strategist Mike Lane. Mike, uh, sometimes when I hear us talking about jobs and infrastructure and taxes and health care, I feel like uh, people may wonder if this is a rerun, because you and I have been talking about these issues for years, even before President Obama became president, we've been talking about these same issues. So I want to talk about something new. I want to talk about the, your party's nominees. Uh, there have been a lot of debates. Candidates, uh, not nominees. Uh, candidates, that's true. Uh, one of them will be the nominee. Uh, right now, they're just candidates. Um, or people like Sarah Palin, who, I don't know, I just call her a tease because uh, I, I don't think she's going to run. I think she's just uh, enjoying her last 15 minutes of fame. I, I think she's got about 10 seconds left, and her fame's about over. Can we agree, Sarah Palin? Her influence, she's gone from the national scene. She, no, she's not gone from the national scene, but she's likely not to be a candidate. Right. And and with that, I think her appeal will go down substantially w once her tease is over. Only to arise like the phoenix from the ashes <laughs> or another. <laughs> God help us all. All right. Well, let's go to the candidate people who are in the race. Uh, Michelle Bachman won the Ames, Iowa poll. Uh, she did that before Rick Perry got in the race, and uh, she was doing pretty well in the polls. Rick Perry got in the race, and I think there can only be one evangelical conservative in the race. He's stolen her thunder. He's taken all her votes. Is that fair? Most of them. For the time being, yes. I think there's room for Michelle Bachman to have a resurgent uh, uh effort here. Uh, but only at Rick Perry's expense, right? I mean, they, they take yeah, from the same, yeah, same part of the electorate. I, I think they're competing essentially for the same votes. Right, right. Uh, Ron Paul, he's got the libertarians. Uh, uh, Michelle Bachman and Rick Perry, they've got the uh, conservatives. Um, Mitt Romney doesn't seem to really have any challenge from his sort of the corporate uh, Wall Street uh, basic, the old line Republican. I, I think Tim Pawlenty was, would have been that challenge. He's out. I mean, the others, Cain, Santorum, uh, Huntsman, they're not going anywhere. Uh, it, it, would, it would be... It Newt Gingrich is it, not going it, anywhere. It would be a miracle if any of those last four that you've uh, mentioned uh, right. were, were to make a real serious run out of it. And, and Newt New Gingrich. i got to tell you, uh, when I watch those debates, and I find the person I find most believable is Newt Gingrich, it tells me something about the direction of your party, because I consider him far to the right, but I consider everyone else running even crazier than Newt Gingrich, well, no. so Newt, he makes the most sense to me, that, that scares me. Newt, Newt Gingrich, as a former professor, is always entertaining, always articulate, always knows how to frame an argument, and, you know, I mean, Newt Gingrich's strength He's been winning is, those debates. N Newt Gingrich's strength is his, is his strength at the podium. Okay, that's, well, that's well where he's he winning is. those debates, why is he nowhere in the polls? Uh, he's yesterday's news. He's old news. Okay. Is this... Is and, 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 he, and he has no money. So, so uh, is this a Rick Perry-Mitt Romney race? That's what the press says. You agree? Um, it, Mitt Romney's in it uh, till the end. Uh, Mitt, 
Rick Perry. Perry may be, may be the prime opposition. Uh, there's still talk uh, from people. Mitch Daniels mentioned just this, this weekend, not that he's getting in, but he said there's room for more people in the race. It's not a done deal yet. Uh, the people thing, aren't happy with what they the got, are they? The thing that, well, the thing that concerns They're not happy me... The thing, the, the thing that concerns me about Romney is he's he's ideally positioned. He he is the guy who should be nailing it down, and for some reason he's doing something that is not nailing it down. He should be he he should be starting to really run away with it at this point. Now I'm I'm dismissing Perry temporarily as the flavor of the month. Really, uh, you think Perry's going to go way down in uh, in, in, in uh, no, three I, months? He'll be but I, but, but way he's, down. In the he's 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 up twice as high as uh, as uh, um, Governor Romney is at this point, and I don't think he's going to stay there. That's what I'm saying. I mean, if you look at the polls, Perry is roughly 30, uh, Romney is roughly 15. Uh, I think that's likely to to balance out. Uh, and and so then he becomes not the flavor of the month. Then he's got to prove that he's a candidate. Is is Rick Perry electable? I mean, a guy that calls Social Security a monstrosity, says it's unconstitutional, a Ponzi scheme. Sure, he can win the nomination. I'll grant you that. Is he electable? It's language that I would not use if I were him. If I was advising him, I would advise him not to use that particular language. Uh, That'll harm him among independents uh, pretty badly, don't you, you think? You know, he's, he's got, right, you've got to keep your eye focused on the 20% in the middle, the swing voters, the people who decide elections. And I don't know that that kind of rhetoric is the kind of rhetoric that's going to bring those independents uh, to him. It, fact, may, it may be that Obama drives them away to him, but I don't think it's anything. I think Mitt Romney is, is much more uh, likely I, I think in the long run to, to win those people. I think you'd that none of the people on the stage in that debate are electable in a general election except Mitt Romney. I mean, Ron Paul, Michelle Bachman, Herman Cain, Newt Gingrich, Rick Santorum, you name them. Uh, Tempolenti maybe, but he's, he's gone. Right. Um, really the only one that I think even you would concede is electable in general election is Mitt Romney. Uh, what, what, let's talk about Pawlenty for a second. Pawlenty failed to connect with the voter. Uh, right. you know, he, had a, he had a resume, he, he had right. a record that he was that, that His was positions favorable. were he something had, that could have gotten him a lot of good general things. election. Um, the rap on him before he got in was he was boring. Uh, the rap may have been right because he just didn't connect with anybody. He didn't build those legions of loyal followers that were willing to come to Ames uh, and support him in oh, the struggle. Oh, and I forgot to mention Huntsman because I actually think Huntsman is electable in general election. He's so electable in general election, he he has not a chance in heck to win a Republican nomination. Uh, you know, Huntsman spent too much time in uh, China. He doesn't uh, understand domestic politics, uh, and so therefore. So, so Romney's he's, it. He's your only Republican nominee that that you think can win a general election. No, I don't. I, no, I, I think that's, that's, that's uh, in the race right now. No, I, I think um, I, I think others could win it. I think uh, I think both Bachman and Perry could win it. Uh, I'm not writing either of those off yet. You think yet. Michelle Bachman could win a general election? I do. I do. I think I, I don't know that it would be her winning it as much as Obama losing it, but I think she could beat Obama. Uh, and Rick Perry as well. Uh, at this point, I think they could. I, I'd be I, so pre predicting 14 months out. So I'm predicting that I think Romney would have an easier chance. You're, you're a Republican strategist. So you give endorsements. Uh, so how come you haven't endorsed Mitt Romney yet? Sounds like you're leaning toward him. I'm leaning towards him. I'm a little concerned as to why he hasn't been able to start nailing it down and going away with it. I'm trying to. I'm trying to find out what. What is he not doing? Let me suggest I mean, to you some reasons. Well, it's, it's, it's the evangelicals. They're, they're not going to be Mitt Romney types. And neither are the Tea Party and groups. They're you know, not big fans the, of Mitt the, Romney. The, the, the Mitt parties. Romney actually is proposing things like, hey, a mandate for health care in Massachusetts. And the Tea Party believes that, you know, as, as uh, Tim Pawlenty said before he got knocked out of the race, Obamacare, uh, this right. idea that people need to be responsible for their own health care that Democrats and independents believe in, but and Romney believes in. That's something that's anathema to the Tea Party. The Tea Party will come around uh, at the end. Um, there is there is so much, so much desire, pent up desire, uh, to replace the current president with with uh, someone less liberal than he is. Uh, that they will support Romney in the end. But, but, but they and the Christian conservatives, they're going to have to hold their nose to vote for Romney, right? Uh, I mean, they're not going to do it with pleasure. Sh shades it's of not going to be like George Bush where they run out. We love George Bush. Shade, shades of Bill Loeb, uh, f late editor of the Manchester Union Leader. When I went to school in New Hampshire, uh, in Manchester, New Hampshire, and on uh, Election Day 1972 when I was in school up there, uh, the front page editorial in the Manchester Union Leader from William Loeb said, hold your nose and vote for Nixon. Okay. Now, was Mitt Romney wrong to say that corporations are people too? We, we've had this discussion. You know, I pull out my constitution you know, and I say, you know, nowhere in here does it say that corporations are people. He's right that the Supreme Court has ruled that way. 
But um, I thought it was a ridiculous ruling. I still think it's a ridiculous ruling. And I think when he defends it, he looks ridiculous. Uh, you know, corporations are entitled to free speech. Corporations uh, are because you know, they're people. Well. So says the Supreme Court. So says the Supreme Court. The Supreme know. Court also chose Bush to be president when the people voted for Gore. I, I, you don't agree with Roe v. Wade. I, we can disagree with the Supreme right. Court. I, I think I think ultimately the election is going to turn on the economy, not whether a corporation is a person for legal purposes, for free speech, you know, and things but, like but that. But the thing is, is that it's broader than the constitutional question. When Mitt Romney says corporations are people too, it suggests what I think is true, that this is a guy who cares more about corporations than he cares about human beings. Corporations are people. Human beings, uh, I'm not so sure. I think he cares about jobs, and corporations create jobs uh, as well as uh, individual proprietorships, small business create jobs, and that's what he's talking about. You know, cor and I'll tell you where corporations, corporations create jobs can't these days. be bashed. They need to be helped to create jobs. I'll tell you where corporations create jobs these days. They create great jobs in India, in China, in Mexico. Uh, outsourcing is, is, is extremely abundant. Uh, we're even relying on child labor. Many, many American corporations, even supposed liberal corporations like Apple, are busy using child labor in China very cheap. Uh, what is Mitt Romney's plan to create jobs in America and not in India and China? Mark, let, let's go back to the 60s when we had uh, Jack Kennedy and, and Lyndon Johnson uh, as Good president. Good president, yes. And then we had, well, we, we had Nixon in the middle, and then we had Jimmy Carter. Look, the whole 60s through the, uh, th through the end of the 70s thing was creating incentives for corporations to create jobs overseas because it was, it was looked at as economic development and economic help. Instead of just giving economic aid to all these countries, if we could get our corporations to invest in those countries and create jobs, this it John would help Kennedy's everything. This is John Kennedy's fault. It started there. It, it's gone through. Now, what you're suggesting is that you, you don't want to invest in these poorer countries anymore. You don't want to help them economically. Uh, you want to bring it all, I'm all back. I'm not against help, helping poor countries. I am, however, against firing Americans so that you can have a call center where people are paid a dollar a day, and that way you can avoid minimum wage laws, you can avoid pollution laws because they're, they're willing in Bangalore to have you know disgusting uh, skies and water and, and so forth because they don't have the environmental... Corporations are moving offshore because they don't want to help American workers. They don't want to help the American environment. And, you know, you can get Chinese and, and Indian and Mexican labor almost at slave rates. That's good for them. It seems to me that we should be punishing companies right. that, that move work. I'll give you an let's, example let's, right here at home that, that's, that's highly fought over. And that's the NLRB ruling that Boeing shouldn't be able to as a, respond the way they said, if, if the union gets so strong here in Washington, if they, we're going to move to South Carolina, that's an internal but it's the same idea. Corporations are trying to mess, screw over American workers, and only the government can help protect the workers against the corporations. Well, I'd love to debate at length how the NLRB, uh, National Labor Relations Board, is trying to kill jobs, but let's leave that for another time. Let's take a very specific example. We have a, a neighbor to the south, Mexico. Uh, they have no economy going on. They have no jobs. They have uh, massive poverty. They, they have massive poverty. They have massive crime. A they few have very rich people. They, they have mass, ma massive crime, massive drug cartels, and things like that. Using American and, and, weapons and, to and, shoot each and other. Supplied by the Obama administration, of all things. You <laughs> a know? few, mostly by Arizona <laughs> gun dealers. A few uh, by the ATF. And those people have been fired and good riddance. Uh, but uh, and let's see where the investigation takes that. But but go as far as you want. I want those people to. Wouldn't it be helpful? Wouldn't it be in our direct interest to see a more economically vibrant Mexico. And doesn't that mean that they would be better off and therefore we would be better off if some of our major corporations made significant major investments you know in Mexico what? and created jobs there? I wish so Mexico that they well. I have nothing against Mexicans. I wish the Indians well. I wish the Chinese well. But there's always going to be a poor country. And if Mexico and China and India get better, then I'm sure that our, our, our but, corporations but Mexi will go but to Mexico's, Mali and, and, and but Mexico's uh, Burkina Faso. On, Mex Mexico's on our border, and they're the ones that are exporting their drugs and exporting their violence into the United States. Uh, I'll make you That's deal. the problem. I have no problem with companies moving to Mexico as long as they pay Mexicans the same minimum wage under the same labor standards they pay American workers. Is that a deal? Well, that would, that would make the millionaires by Mexican standards. I, I, I it certainly would. Do that. I think it's a great idea. Hey, it would disrupt, hey, Mexicans it, it would fairly, disrupt the Mexican and Americans economy. will get the job. Thank you so much for coming on, Mike. Mark, it's been a lot of fun. Always good debate with you, and we will be back again. Check out the Inside Scoop. Go to marklevine.tv, M-A-R-K-L-E-V-I-N-E.tv. I was just on Russian TV arguing about Syria. You can see a whole host of things. Check it out.